Last presentation, first Laracon, um, Matt Stauffer, Titan, my old friend, Matt, he's really the reason that I'm in a position to have been able to do any of this. Welcome him to the stage, please. Thanks, buddy. Hey. He said, I don't know how to talk about you to make you sound like you're important. I don't know what things to say. And I said, well, please just say that you're my old friend. And that is because he is my old friend, but also because if I have any impact in the community, I'd rather it not be a book or whatever. I'd rather it be that I helped people live the lives they're going to live. And so that was kind of like a, it was a shticky thing, but like that really gives me a lot of joy in meeting all of y'all and hearing about how your lives have been different as a result of this. I mean, I didn't make, you know, Laravel, so that's, that's for Taylor, but I get a lot of joy from it too, because I spent a lot of my life in this community. So meeting all of y'all and seeing what your lives are like is really cool. Um, they weren't joking, it is hot and bright, but I'm trying to find some people to make some eye contact with a little bit, so. Um, okay, so today's talk, patterns that pay off. Um, design behavior, organizational patterns that will make a real impact on your company and your code base. That is a handful, it's a mouthful, there's a lot to do, I'm gonna try and get through it and not talk too fast. I said, every, I said to quite a few people, I, I went too, um, too long at Laracon US when I give this talk, um, and so I said I'm gonna remove some of the content so that I don't go too long and also so I don't talk too fast. And they're like, well, we, we understand the American accent, Matt, you know? But it's funny because I can't understand you all when you talk too fast, and so I just assumed it was the same thing. And they're like, no, we watch American TV, you don't watch Australian TV, it's not the same, so whatever, I tried it anyway. So this is me, I'm Matt. Uh, a lot of the work that we do at Titan is writing new code. Somebody hires us to write new code for them, okay, that's great. A lot of what we do is join existing companies, existing code bases, and write code along with them. But one of the things that I do the most is I join existing companies and I audit their code. So I'm looking at other people's code and they say, hey, look, we can't afford to bring you guys in for the next three years, we'd love to do that. Can you come in and help us get stuff better and then step back out? And that better might be improving their code base, it might be helping them scale up to more developers or whatever else it looks like, but there's almost always some element in that of come in and tell us what we need to do better. So a lot of my life is looking at other people's code, looking at their architecture, looking at their problems, looking at their processes, and helping them do it better. So we're gonna talk about patterns today. And an important aspect that very few people talk about when they talk about patterns is that there's actually two different types of patterns. And one type of pattern is a pattern where something is happening on a regular basis, and so you're identifying the pattern. So a regular or intelligible form or sequence discernible in certain actions or situations. So that means something happens regularly, over and over and over. There's a pattern there. But the other thing is more of a template, a model or design used as a guide in needlework or other crafts. So notice one of these, you're recognizing a pattern that's already there. And the other one, there's a pattern that is something that you should do repetitively. And so there's kind of two different sides of this. And in our world, one of them is the pattern that is the problem. There's a pattern that's a problem. We see this thing happening. It's a problem. We need to deal with it. And the other one's the pattern of the solution. If you see a certain type of problem, hey, somebody has already made up a solution for you, a design pattern. And so we need to look at them from those two different sides as you approach the whole rest of this talk. So the first thing we're going to do in this talk is talk about the correct posture we should have towards patterns, especially design patterns, because sometimes we can go really, really crazy with those. We'll talk about those in a second. But also about identifying patterns in our code, problem patterns in our code and problem patterns in our architecture. Um, so first is how to think about patterns, and the second of them is the second piece we're going to talk about is some common patterns we use in our writing code in, um, at Titan or helping other people fix their code. I made this distinction up. Nobody else I don't know of has actually talked about this before, but as I was thinking through patterns, especially prescriptive patterns, so the patterns that tell us how to fix things, remember the template type patterns, there's two primary types. One of them is preventative, and the other one is reactive. So think about it this way. There's, uh, you go, um, actually, you know, I think I made, sli oh, I made slides for them. This is great. Um, so preventative patterns <laughs> are sort of like floss, right? It says do this every day. And so something like floss every day or avoid N plus one queries or avoid ENV calls in your non-config code. So these are things you should do all the time and they will make your coding go better. They'll make your code bases go better. They'll make your architecture better. These are things that you should just do because they're gonna make your life better, okay? So that's the preventative. But the reactive is a little bit more like when X happens, then do Y, right? And so these are things along the lines of like, get a root canal to fix your cracked tooth. I had that, don't do a root canal unless you have a cracked tooth, it's not a lot of fun. Um, or create a microservice to isolate slow adapter infrastructures. You don't just make a microservice because you make them, you make them because there's a definite need for them. Or make a factory to, isol or to normalize multiple exchangeable implementations. And our biggest problem is that we take preventative patterns, which are, or we treat reactive patterns, which are supposed to address an issue, 
and we treat them as if they're preventative. We just use them all the time. I'm really excited about buzzwords, so I'm going to use that on every single project all the time. And that's a big problem that we run into. So as we're looking through all these patterns today, let's think about the fact that some of them should always be used. Some of them should be used in response to a particular problem. Think about it this way. If all you have is a hammer, everything looks like a nail. And so, you know, there's a joke about PHP being the double-sided hammer, all that kind of stuff, whatever. And I have to talk about that right now. But think about this in our world. If all you have is a command bus, then everything looks like a command, right? Or whatever your latest thing is, a repository or, uh, you know, I don't even know. Whatever, whatever the cool new hotness is, um, once we have it, we want to use it, even when it's not necessarily the appropriate thing. So when you think about a pattern, think about what solution or what problem it's supposed to be the solution for and use it when it's needed. Underlying all of this is these concepts of YAGNI or KISS. YAGNI is you aren't going to need it. KISS is keep it simple, stupid. The, the, the primary concept I want you to come away with here is don't do stuff you don't need. Okay? The number one problem that I want you to walk away from this not having is not, uh, you know, the fact that you need more adapters, whatever, that you can handle speed issues, it's the fact that you're not going to reach for these things until you actually have a need for them. And you're going to be able to differentiate between a preventative and a reactive um, pattern. So you identify problems, and then you provide the solutions. There's a really great talk at Laracon EU 2015 by Constantine. I can't pronounce his last name. And he talked about the fact that a lot of writing good code is really about the cost of change. How, what cost is it, and what work does it take for us to make changes in our application in the future. Because we've talked about here about greenfield versus brownfield applications, right? The new code that's really easy to write, the old code that's a lot harder to write. And sometimes we just look at the old code and we say, well, it's because they were bad at their jobs. Well, often that's not really the case. It's because over years it's accumulated fixes for various things and stuff like that. And so it just can be difficult to take that stuff that has all of that embedded in there and then modify it. So well-written code minimizes the cost of change. And he says, everybody's going to have to deal with cost of change, because as long as your application lives for a certain amount of time, it's going to have to change. Product is going to come along and say, we want this different consumers, uh, tech stack, whatever. Those things are all going to change. Um, and one of the things that we often run into is this illusion that we're capable of minimizing the cost of change in the future by analyzing, right? The whole concept of waterfall is do as much work as you possibly can up front to ensure that cost of change is low later. And it's a total illusion. We're not actually capable of doing that. Great talk. You should definitely listen to it. It was very influential for me. This is also the same as crazy over architecture of your software patterns. A lot of the things that we jokingly call you know, being an astronaut or architecture astronaut are really a developer doing the same thing. Waterfall is the process person, so maybe the project manager is saying we can do all this analysis up front. But being an architecture astronaut is just being the developer version of that. If I just make this perfect pattern with all the adapters and the blah, 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 and it's super abstracted, then it will handle all the problems that happen in the future. What really ends up happening is you build a really, really difficult to navigate system that's very hard to change that you think can adapt for everything, and then some change happens that's not the change you're expecting, but now your code is really, really, really really intense and very difficult to change, and you just made everything worse and wasted a whole bunch of time. So instead, write code that's easy to delete. Simple, small code, OK? And then there's someone who works at Titan named Logan, and he's, just, he's like, I don't care if you do anything else in this talk, but you need to make a slide that says write code that's easy to delete. So I did this for Logan, and he's absolutely right. Because if you think about cost of change in three years of some very large application, what is going to be difficult? Is it going to be making a change to that perfectly astronaut astronaut created thing where it's an adapter that needs one tiny little modification or is it more likely that you have an overly architected system where everything's totally interconnected this way and you weren't able to predict the future but you tried and so it's really crazy. So if you have a whole bunch of simple pieces of code and you just say well let's just delete that and rewrite it in this new way based on this new understanding you have, okay great, that's not hard to change. One last thing before we actually get into the patterns, I want to point out the fact that when I say patterns that pay off, the payoff is more important than the patterns. And I hope I kind of have started kind of putting this idea in your heads already. But this is not a talk about patterns. This is not a talk about, you know, you should learn this pattern and that pattern. There's books about that. There's people who know that way better than I do. I studied English in college. I am not a computer science degree. I don't know about, I literally don't know what a linked list is. That's not, I'm not the person for that. But I also have a successful software consultancy and we make money and we do a good job. So my hope is that you are going to be able to get the payoff. I want you to be able to solve people's problems well. I want to be able to have a great job and make lots of money. Whatever the things are that you want, I want you to be able to use software to do that. So the goal here is the payoff, doing the things that the, your constituents, whoever they are, need, not the patterns. Patterns are just tools to get you to where you want to go. Okay, so hopefully you have the right attitude towards patterns at this point. So now let's actually look at a few patterns. So once again, I made up entirely non-existent in the rest of the world, but I made them up and I like them, delineations between the three different types of patterns I'm going to talk about today. 
And these are the type of patterns, and while you read them, I'm going to take a drink of water. I made these up, but I think they're going to be good. Am I, am I speaking too fast, or am I doing OK? <laughs> too slow? <laughs> what? I literally have never heard that in my life, so I'm, you know, this is good. We might have time for like Q&A afterwards at this point. All right, so we got three types of patterns. The three types of patterns are process patterns, which have to do with the interactions between people and tasks, or developers and other developers, or PM and developers, or product and developers, or whatever. They're, they're about process and communication and people. And the second one is architecture, and they have to do with the higher architecture pieces of how your code is structured and how your DevOps work and all that kind of stuff. And the last one is factoring and refactoring, actually writing the lines of code and what it looks like to do things like, what, for example, we saw in Adam's and Dave's talk where we're actually looking at lines of code and how to make them work better and simpler and more clearly and without 300 line long controller methods. Um, I did cut some because of you, know, you guys being Australian and all, me trying to talk slowly and everything like that. Um, but I kept them all in the, the, the notes. Um, so there's going to be, I think, three in each of those. There's quite a few more. So if you go look at the notes later, you'll be able, the slide deck I'll put on, on Twitter later, you'll be able to see the rest of them. So all right, so the first one, also I got to shout out Noemi Olvera, who works at Titan, did all these designs for me, and she's wonderful and makes me look like I know what I'm doing. Um, I came up with a clever name, though, which is No Precogs. And if you've never seen Minority Report, precogs are three little people that sit in a circle like that with their heads facing the middle. That's what that means. And they can tell the future. That's literally the whole point of this. You can't tell the future. I mean, you probably heard that from the things I've talked to you about so far. You're not capable of telling the future. And a huge number of process issues that happen in software teams are because we think we can tell the future, but we can't. So so we make decisions as if we could, and then it, we can't, and then it screws us over. So for example, Waterfall is based around the idea that we can break the future. If we just do enough thinking up front, we're going to know exactly what the next two years of software looks like. And everyone knows that it doesn't work, and so everybody's mad at the end. The other option is, I've, I've seen this particular piece of code twice, therefore I'm going to build a massively architected system that will assume that this piece of code is going to happen multiple times, and I can predict the way it's going to happen over the next year. But then some new requirement comes along, and almost every single time it happens in a way that you didn't predict, and now you're stuck in that super concrete system. So, the payoff that you get, and each of these is going to be a pattern and then a payoff, okay? So the payoff you get from not trying to assume that you have the ability to predict the future is that you're avoiding these primary problems. You're not committing to unrealistic timelines, which makes for unhappy clients and unhappy devs. You're not over-architecting to try and reduce the cost of change. You're not becoming rigid. When you know that you can't predict the future, all you're able to do is just respond to what's in front of you, and that's it. And that actually leads you to write better code that reduces the cost of change. Um, instead, you feel free to do the best work you have only with the requirements in front of you at that moment. And that doesn't mean we can't ever say, well, we know definitively that we're going to hook up with that new insurance provider in two months. Well, then, OK, that's. That's okay because they're actually going to show up and they're going to dump three million people in your system. Okay, that's fine. But that's not like, oh, and one day down the road, somebody might ask for this one thing or that thing. There's a difference between those. All right, our next pattern is called code-based consistency. So again, remember, these patterns are things, primarily these original ones are going to be the, um, forget the word, but prescriptive, basically do them all the time, flossing, right? These are going to be things that are be good for you almost all the time. So the next one is called code-based consistency, read bullets. Um, so what we're talking about here is what we want to be doing is enforcing that everybody who writes the code writes the code the same way. And you might say, well, what about my personality? Well, your personality is not shown best by where you put your braces, right? What we want to do is understand that everybody at the company, everybody in the organization, everybody in the team is writing with a consistent code style. Code organization, what goes where? What packages do we use? What packages do we not use? How do we do our version control? How do we do our git? Do we rebase? Do we merge? How do we name them? Do we preface with our, you know, our, um, our, uh, what's the word, letters of your name, that thing. <laughs> Initials, I was like, our acronym, that's definitely not it. Uh, what strategies we use for pull requests, who handles the, the merging of code and the review of the code, all that kind of stuff. Um, what I mainly want you to walk away from this is saying that like, your, your code style is not your magnum opus, okay? Your creative contribution to your team is not where you put your braces. Hopefully it should be the solutions you provide to people. It's the same kind of patterns that pay off idea. Your solution should be making your customers happy. You should be making the other developers happy. It should be doing a great job and being satisfied with the work you do. And that does not come from braces and lines and all those kind of little things. So the payoff here is it's easier to onboard new devs to this project because they don't have to learn what preference you had when you're writing this one. It's always the same across all your code bases. There's less cognitive load because they can spend their time understanding the domain instead of spend the time understanding these little tiny nuances and details. 
good patterns get ingrained into the company culture because when you join, you just learn this is how we do things and that's it. You don't have to think about it. You can think about other and more creative and interesting things. And your developers spend their brain power on stuff that matters. The amount of times that I have has to, I've had to waste time on a pull request dealing with telling somebody to do their code spacing the right way, that all that time means that I didn't spend on that time that pull request saying, well, you weren't actually meeting the customer's needs that way. I spent all that time reviewing where your braces were and I didn't actually install the code locally and run it because it took me three hours to fix your braces and then I just kind of threw my hands up in the air and kept going. When you spend your brain power on code style and organization and stuff like that, other than when you're first setting up the project to figure it out, it's wasted brain power that's not spent on stuff that actually matters. All right, the next pattern is called four eyes. So the idea behind four eyes, four eyes is that no code can get merged to production without two sets of eyes on it. And that's something we do at Titan for every single one of our projects. Um, and so what that usually means is one developer writes the code, they pull request it, and then one code reviewer reviews the code. However, sometimes it's also two pair programmers are writing code at the same time, and then they're able to merge it because both of them are seeing it at the same time. Some of you are chuckling because you read the asterisk, which says, if any team members have more or less than two eyes, the number can be modified. I'm not, <laughs> and that may be a religious, you know, that's fine, that's, that's cool. But, but the idea is that no one person writes code and then commits the code. And there's a lot of benefits you get from this. One of them is you, you avoid the negative consequences of hyper focus. I mean, how many times have you gone down some crazy rabbit trail, d diving deep into something, you commit the code, and you forgot that you broke four things on the way because you were just testing. You left a DD in there, or a console log in there, or something else like that. But additionally, not just that, your reviewing brain is different than your writing brain. The way you approach looking at code that you wrote or somebody else wrote, you have a different perspective, a different way from thinking about it than when you like, had to go down that total rabble trail. And so we actually think about things different even if it's our own code. Also, two different people bring two different perspectives. They've worked with different languages, they've worked on different teams, they've seen different projects, they've been bit, down, bit by different things, but also they might have different disabilities or families with different experiences or something that made, made recognize to them, well, did you check that for red-green colorblindness or something like that? There's all sorts of things that two different unique human beings can bring to the same line of code. Even if they're both writing or they're both reviewing, we can all look at it differently. And finally, there's a shared responsibility. At no point am I the only one who is the one who introduced the code that broke the whole thing. And there, it's, it's silly to say that, right? All it is is about making sure that nobody else blames just me. But that actually does a lot. It actually helps a lot to say, at any given moment, I feel comfortable pushing. Not only has somebody else seen it, so it's not all me, but if something else breaks, it's not all on me. And that goes a long way to just relieve the weight of a lot of projects from our shoulders all the time. And that's actually pretty valuable. All right, uh, bonus tip, six eyes, review your own code. Uh, Everybody has to do this at Titan as well. So we use GitHub. We use GitHub pull requests. Every single piece uh, time that code is introduced to our um, code bases, it's through GitHub pull requests. And so what you do is you push up the pull request, and then before you tag someone, you read through it. And then you catch the DDs, and you catch the console logs, and you realize that you left that thing in there you shouldn't have, or you didn't commit the thing you should have, or whatever else it ends up being. So write the code, review the code, and then have somebody else review the code. That's even better. All right. So those were process patterns. There's actually two more really, really great process patterns that are in the, the notes. One of them has to do with how we approach Agile at Titan. Um, we call it low, lowercase Agile, and I think the majority of the Agile word, world, like Scrum and people who pronounce it Agile and stuff like that is total BS, and it's just waterfall under a different name, so go check the notes or hit me up later about that. Uh, but we're going to move on. So now we're going to talk about a little bit higher level code stuff, architecture. So we're kind of narrowing down from higher level process to now we're in the middle and we're architecture, and then we'll eventually get down to low level code. My first one is monolith first. I didn't say monolith only, but I did say monolith first. So you've probably heard of API first, where you design the API and then you consume it, and both your JavaScript and your mobile consume that API. It's very exciting. It's very good. You've heard of microservices. We had talks about them. People really like microservices, and it's one of those things where they say, oh, hi, microservices are the great new buzzword, so we're just going to do microservices everywhere. Split your app into a million pieces. It's you know separation concerns, yada, yada, yada. So what I want you to do is consider monolith first. There's a lot of reasons for monolith first, and we heard one of them when um, the farm company, whose name I can never remember, uh, talked earlier, because they are talking about the fact that when they separate... I can't hear you well enough, so it's on the banner. Figured. When they were talking about it, they talked about the fact that uh, they have to have these very real-time aspects of the financial transactions happening. And that's just one of the many reasons why monoliths are better um, until they're not better. Uh, so it's not that you should never do microservices, but there are costs that they introduce. And the vast number of times when people are talking about the values of microservices, what they don't talk about is that they also introduce costs. This is something we've discovered a lot, and we talk about a lot at Titan. Um, and we recognize that every single time you introduce a microservice, you now have to duplicate test data. You have to duplicate um, 
uh, you know, your fixtures in, in tests, you have to duplicate validation sometimes. You have to coordinate pull request merging at the same time. You have to coordinate the rollbacks, all this kind of stuff. There's a lot of complexity that gets introduced, and sometimes it's worth it, but sometimes it's not. So until it's worth it, don't do it. That's the main thing. You get some payoffs here. Um, you're avoiding primarily the costs that come along with those things until you need them. So they are more complicated. I wish I just looked at the slide. Um, more error-prone synchronization of testing. Um, more complicated branching and deploys. Uh, higher upfront development costs. I mean, it literally just takes longer to write code across two code bases versus to write the exact same code in one code base. And you have reduced flexibility when every, everything has to go across the HTTP boundary. So, OK, next one. Seeds, not dumps. Um, if you are currently using dumps of production data for your local development or for your tests, stop it. <laughs> now, please. It will bite you at some point. Um, it's probably already bitten you multiple times. You probably at some point have some compliance officer that said, so wait, whose personal information is on every single developer's computer right now? Or, is, or, or there's the one guy who wants to be normalizing all of it and is working on the version that doesn't have all that, but hasn't actually happened yet, so you just kind of don't tell the compliance officer, whatever else it ends up being. Um, you will, at some point in your life, regret having production data on developers' computers. Production of data belongs in production, and that's it. Seeds are wonderful. Thankfully, David already talked about these quite a bit. There's all sorts of clever and interesting things we can do with seeds. And most people who are using production data for local development, they're doing it because it's hard to set up the seeds. Every once in a while, they actually set up the seeds, but they say, well, yeah, but our seeds don't have robust enough differentiation, right? You set up seeds for your local and your testing, but it doesn't cover this one edge case. Well, just add a seeder that covers that edge case. I mean, it's just like tests, right? You discover that there's an edge case that things weren't happening first. Well, first of all, write a test. Second of all, write a seed for that test. And if you need it in your general testing data, add a seeder that does that, and then move on with your life. You know, that's the basics of it. So it doesn't have to be that difficult. So you want randomized seeders so you can handle things that you weren't expecting in the first place. A lot of times production data is more diverse in some areas you weren't predicting, but also a lot of times it's less diverse in other areas. And so all of a sudden you have your first person ever sign up from the US and then their telephone numbers shaped differently or whatever else it ends up being and the whole thing blows up. So seeders help you kind of get those things out of the way before the person signs up, not after. Um, Oh yeah, pro tip, reference production data help you improve your seeds. So again, if you do find yourself in a situation where you say, well, the production data is more diverse and that allows us to test better, we'll just use that production data to make better seeds. So payoffs. Um, you can do uh, continuous integration and continuous deployment because you actually have the ability to use all that stuff in your testing. Because a lot of times when people use production data and local development, then they, they then use that as an excuse for why they can't write good tests. Um, testing is easier. Onboarding new users is easier because you don't have to get them sign off to get the dump of the anonymized data that's not really that anonymized. Uh, fixing bugs is easier. I mean, all these things are easy. And you're less scared to make changes locally. I mean, I literally could tell you over 10 people who have accidentally sent an email to their entire customer base or who've accidentally charged money to their entire customer base because they had the toggle set wrong when they're working production data and local. So just don't do it. It reduces fragility as well. Um, all right, the next one is test to save your job. So this one is an architecture thing to teach you about how to get started in testing. And if you're already started in testing, help you understand the most important aspects of testing. So the best place to start your tests is by asking yourself, what part of this app, if broken, would make me worried for my job? What, what part of your job makes you worried about losing it? What would you get fired for? What code are you writing that might potentially break something that would make your boss kind of storm down to your office and you'd be like calling up your spouse and you're like, honey, you know, I might be working for Starbucks. You guys don't have Starbucks. Whatever the generic working for Starbucks is for you. That's not a bad thing, but it still is blowing my mind. You have 7-Eleven and you don't have Starbucks? Like, I don't even get that one, so. But no, I've heard there's, I, I heard there's like one of, oh yeah, well, so do I. I'm on board with you on that. I heard there's like one of them in all of Sydney. Yeah, yeah, okay, there you go. Um, uh, Nano Espresso, I think every time I go to these conferences, I fall in love with one coffee shop and tell everybody to go there. I think it's called Nano Espresso and it's like some of the best coffee of my life. So if you live in Sydney, go get coffee there, it's amazing. All right, so ask yourself these questions about what would get me fired. And it's not always exactly what would get me fired. It would be what would make my customers angry, what would make my uh, boss embarrassed, whatever else it ends up looking. What's most likely to break? What do I have the least control over, right? Or what do I have the most control over and what am I most responsible for? Um, what are we about to refactor? What would make my client stressed out? What would make me stress out? Think through those things, and that's the first place to write the tests. Because the moment those tests exist, and you've done a good job writing those tests, all of a sudden, that's not something that stresses you out anymore. That's not something that stresses your clients out anymore. Or at least, it doesn't need to stress them out, and you can confidently tell them don't stress because, hey, I wrote tests around that specific thing. And one of the things we actually ended up doing at one point was we were writing this tool that consumes a lot of data, 
and then it spits that data back out as an API. And we had multiple clients that were using it. And one client said, we're very happy with the way this works. We built our iOS app on this. It's totally deployed. Thousands of people are using it. Please never change it again. And then the new client who was using the same thing said, we want a million changes, right? So we're like, wow, it's kind of hard to be totally confident that our tests cover all this stuff. So Samantha Geitz wrote a, a test for every single API call that the iOS made the iOS app made. And she just like looked through, she used the app the whole way, she recorded all the calls it was making, and she wrote a test for every single one of those. There's a suite of tests that just says make sure that iOS app works or whatever. And it's separate from the rest of our tests that are more developer focused. It's literally like, hey, as long as these tests work and they spit out the type of things in the shape that the iOS app is expecting without any errors, that means we didn't break the iOS app. And so then we're good to go, and we feel super confident about that very kind of narrow set of things. So think that way. What things bother you? What things are you worried about? What things changing would be really bad? And write tests around those things. So number one payoff is you get to keep your job. Number two payoff is because you're not testing because someone told you you should, which is one of the big problems with all these patterns. You're testing because it actually is providing value to you. And the number one difficulty about getting into tests and convincing your boss you should be doing tests is because it's hard to make this value. It's, it's sort of like you should. Anything that is you should is very difficult to persuade yourself to spend the time on to, to persuade other people to pay you to do. But anytime you could say it will bring this immediate benefit right now, those things become a lot easier. It also means that when you have a 0% test coverage code base and you add 20% test coverage, those 20% of tests actually matter, rather than when we, we pick the 20% of the tests that are the easiest to add and don't tell anybody that they're not actually making our code base any better. And the last one is you get to keep your job. <laughs> First and last you know, is kind of important. OK, so let's talk about some factoring slash refactoring patterns. So interestingly, um, having giving this talk at the same conference where Adam and David gave the talks that they gave. Um, this, I would have loved to give this talk first and then have them kind of build on these. So with some of these, I'm just going to say, hey, just go reference what they did. And you'll see some shared kind of thinking between these. But a lot of these have to do with stuff that us as programmers, when we look at these super, super long controller methods or these super long lines and jobs, whatever else that ends up being, it's just often the space where we say, it's too long. There's too much complexity in this one space. I'm going to pull it out to private method and hope that makes me feel better about my life. And a lot of these have to do with the fact that we just need to think a little more creatively about how our code is structured. If you haven't read the book Refactoring, it's super, super long. There's a lot of good stuff in there. But I'm going to cover, I think it's three, just three of the best kind of ways for us to approach looking at some of the more common places where we get bloat in our applications and how to pull some of them out. And hopefully these will inspire you to do some more. Go read that book. Also, check the slides because there's like three that I skipped out of here. So the first we're going to look at is seed each test. It sounds a little similar to the one we were at last, but this is much different. You'll notice this is similar to what David Hemphill talked about a little bit. But a lot of people that I've noticed what they'll do is they'll seed once at the beginning of the testing situation. And they'll have a seed, and it's, it, it's everything there, and they have all the relationships they need. And then every single one of their tests makes assumptions that that seeder ran once, and nothing has changed it since. They run all their tests against it. And then the moment that one of their tests makes a change to that, the next test might break, right? Or the next test might now be written against the changes that were made by the first test. But then if you try to run the second test in isolation, all of a sudden it doesn't work. Because there's this, this state that's living from test to test to test that is that one state. So one of the things that's going to make your testing life significantly better, and the reason they do that is to avoid the thing that David showed us in his code, which was you're doing all that crazy setup at the top. They're like, oh, great, well, let's just do the setup once at the beginning. No, don't do that. Instead, use things like what David showed us, or use um, factory stories or whatever else, um, factory states or anything else like that, to, to set up the beginning of every single test so that that test is very clear, it's seeded, it does its assertions, and then at the end, it's migrated back or rolled back or whatever else it ends up being. So. Um, reading the slides is good. Um, yeah, so it's okay to seed some stuff up front. So for example, in a multi-tenant app, you might want to seed just the, the couple tenants up front. But don't seed the stuff that's directly under test up front. So some of the benefits we get here, for example, if you've ever seen a line of code where you see something like, um, you know, test user uh, can delete comments or something like that. And so you say, grab user 7, and then you hit the delete comment route for comment 42, and then you say assert that user has 13 comments. Well, where did those numbers come from? Well, it's because somebody at some point was looking at the seeders that they built, and they decided those were the ones that hadn't been modified by the previous test that they could really hope there's going to be that number. That's not the way to do it, because first of all, it's totally fragile, totally breakable. But second of all, the person who comes along to this code in six months is going to have no idea what's actually going on. So instead, what you do is at the beginning, you see the user, you see 13 comments, you hit the delete, and then you assert that there's 12 comments. I don't have to know anything about the state prior to this. All I do is read the code. And so it puts the code and the data that it's affecting and that it's reasoning about kind of connected to each other at the same place. It makes it so much easier to reason about. Um, 
and it also has no, you never have to run this hole. It works when I run that other test before it, but not after it. The next one we're going to talk about is custom requests. So remember in Adam's talk, he talked a little bit about the fact that most controller methods are separated into three sections. And so the first section gets data and validates the data. The second section does its operations on the data. And then the third section returns something back. So two of the ones I have here are going to give you, one's going to be about inputting data, and one's going to be about outputting data. And again, there's more if you take a look at the slides later. So this one is about a way to input data. So it's a little bit similar to what David showed you earlier, where he was doing the custom database lookups on the, um, the request objects. But that's kind of uh, like 201 level. I'm going to start at 101 level. So the main thing is, imagine the fact that the vast majority of times we're pulling data out of a request. What we do is we type in the request object right in our controller method. And we say, give me an instance of Illuminate HTTP request, and then you use the input method, or the get method, or the only method, or whatever. You're pulling data out of that thing, right? Well, did you know that if you make a custom class that extends Illuminate HTTP request, and then you type in that instead, you can put methods all over that thing, and then use those methods on the thing you type in. But since it extends Illuminate HTTP request, it'll also be hydrated the same way. So you can basically have a super-powered request object that you can do all sorts of interesting stuff with. And so let's take a look at some a couple, uh, real quick. So the, the form requests work that same way, but we're not going to worry about form requests because then we have to duplicate the authorize method and stuff, so we wouldn't worry about it. So imagine that you had a sign-up request, and every single time you dealt with a sign-up request, which maybe happened three different times, or who knows, maybe even happened once, you had to do all this crazy work to prepare the input. Maybe it's a seven-stage input thing, or who knows what. And you have to do all this work to prepare it. And preparing it really has nothing to do with the work of the controller method. Maybe it's happening in three different contexts, or for whatever reason, it's not really relevant. Well, then make a prepared method, do the preparation in there, and then when you type hint, instead of H, illuminate HTTP request, you type hint sign up request, and now you can just use that prepared method to get your data out. That's one very, very, very simple example. But just like David was showing us, these things that seem so magic, we have the ability to modify them. The illuminate HTTP request, you just extend it and do something new with it, do something interesting with it. You might end up saying that you really want to. Um, and, you know, have some setup process. Remember, Adam gave us an example that was a checkout. Well, instead of doing a popo, you might end up doing a checkout request or something like that. I don't know. You have the ability to look at the code you're doing and understand how does it make sense to, to you and to the end user as what's actually coming through. What do those first seven lines really mean? Are they really validating, or is there some other domain logic? And there's a lot of different ways you can work with it. And of course, you can always just start with a, a popo as a plain old PHP object. You can always just create a plain old PHP object, like the checkout object that Adam did. But sometimes you can also work within the Laravel core to give yourself some superpowers to these things you're already working with on a regular basis. Payoff, you get smaller controllers, easier testing because you, you can now test that prepared method separately from your controllers. Um, and you can also separate out some of your repetitive logic, for example, inputting and preparing data. All right, so we talked about getting data in and simplifying that a little bit. And now let's talk a little bit about getting data out. So I want to talk about view data composition, which is the process of getting the data that was input to your controller, modified, and now you're spitting it back out. What does it look like for us to get that data out? I think there's four primary ways we want to think about doing this. And a lot of these four aren't very commonly used in our community. So I want to talk about these four. And I want to say that a lot of oversized controllers are not actually oversized because of the input or even because of the action. They're, they're because of the work we do to get that data ready to actually go to the view. I mean, the number of times you've seen a controller method that have 17 lines, and all it is is just getting your data prepared in the right way so the view has access to those 17 different graphs or whatever else it ends up being. That stuff doesn't really belong in the controller if we can get it out of there. And I'm not saying you need to feel shame if you do view prep there, but there are patterns that allow us to have the space to do that. So let's look at four of them. So the first one is called the presenter. It's layering one thing on top of another thing. It's often layered on top of an eloquent model. So you would say, well, I don't want to add these methods to the model because they only exist to help this model do certain things just in the view context. Great, presenter is a, certain, a really great object. So you basically wrap this class around your eloquent model, whatever else it ends up being, and you add methods or overwrite methods purely for a presentational context. Sort of like a decorator, but for views. Or there's a view model, which is a plain old PHP object whose entire existence is to take some data into the constructor and then make methods available that, that works with that data to export it in a certain way that you want accessible to you. So for example, if you have a, a statistics service and then a collection of users, you put both of them in, the, in and I'll, I'll show you some code in just a second, and then it has those 17 methods for those 17 graphs I was talking to you about. Throw that all in that class, test that class separately, and now all you have to do is basically instantiate it in your controller and pass it into the view. 
or there's a responsible. It's a thing that's available specifically in Laravel where it implements an interface that says, if I return this thing directly from a controller, it actually knows how to generate its own HTTP response. So responsible says, I actually have a method on me that has the ability to generate an HTTP response of some sort that Laravel can handle. And so similar to a view model, but a view model, you still have to pass to a view. Well, where responsible actually already knows how to generate whatever kind of response you want, whether it's a view response or a JSON response or whatever else. Again, we'll look at this code in a second. And then the last one is this thing called a view components, which is using view, V-U-E, um, inspiration about how they do components to create a little bit of a structure. Um, it was something that was introduced originally by Jeff Ochoa, and then, of course, Spotsy turned into a package because that's what they do. Um, so we'll look at those in just a second. All right, so we're going to walk through those four real quick. So. The first one is the post presenter. So remember, these are presenters, which is kind of decorators, right? But this is in a view context. So essentially, the constructor takes the object that we're working with. This one happens to be an eloquent object called post. Pulls it in, and then we're going to basically have a whole bunch of other methods. Usually, there's some magic methods that make it really easy to call the, the, um, the properties of the, the base object um, without having to make uh, accessors for all of them. But then also, we now come up with some kind of syntax that we're going to use that means to present it. And for example, if you've ever done this thing where you just globally make all the published at and the created at and the whatever the other dates are to be formatted a certain way because you want it in the view and then later you need the carbon version of it and you go, oh crap, now I used it that way everywhere and I'm totally stuck. Well, this is a way to say only present it that way for this specific view. And you may end up just calling those specific methods in your views. You may end up coming up with a little clever solution where every single time you call it, it looks for a present version of it first. And if that doesn't exist, then it calls the original. There's also plenty of packages that do this. Don't worry specifically about, about the implementation details. But the idea of this is it's a little light layer that sits on top of your thing just for one context. So you can see, basically, we pass post. But instead of passing the post object, we pass a post presenter wrapped around the post object. The next one we're talking about is the view model. This one is, doesn't have any magic. It literally just takes in the thing, and then it makes methods available. It's the simplest possible thing. All it does is just say, oh, you want this chart? There's a method for that chart. You want that chart? There's a method for that chart. And they'll have access to whatever data you passed in. Similarly, you pass it in. But one of the conventions we have there is instead of calling that thing post, well, it's not post because it's exposing a whole bunch of stuff. So you often call it VM for view model. Um, if you've ever heard about Sandy Metz talking about trying to pass as few pieces of data to your views as possible, this is a very common way to do that in the Ruby and Rails communities is to, to get one object whose sole responsibility is to collect together your data. Again, it's super easy to test this way, slimmer controllers, and you're not having to remember the name of 17 different uh, variables that you pass in the specific view. All right, the next one's responsible. Similarly, we're passing in some data. Um, but interestingly, instead of just returning that data back out, we're actually returning an Illuminate HTTP response of some sort. So you actually have this two response method. Um, and when you implement responsible, Laravel knows, oh, I'll just take that response and go grab its two response method and then treat that as my response. So this is kind of cool because you pass the data in that you want to work with, and then you decide what the output's going to look like. But it's not that different until you realize that you can put logic in here that might be very awkward to put a controller. So one of the things you might have heard of is people are often saying, why don't we have something in Laravel like Rails has where you can put the, you know, the, the file name at the end and the same controller can serve a JSON response or an HTML response, right? Well, with these things, it turns out you can do that. You notice there, that little change right there between two response. Uh-oh, I'm breaking things by clicking too fast. See that? All of a sudden, with those three lines of code, we have now made this responsible capable of differentiating based on the request. And it could be based on that, or it could be based on a query parameter or whatever. And all of a sudden, you're getting different data back depending on the response that you got. But that, that's all served by the same controller method. And people looking at that controller method wouldn't necessarily have to know that's happening if you don't care. So there's a lot more complex work that you can do in here. And again, it's a lot easier to test in this context. And finally, this clever little thing. Um, th if you have never worked with this before, it's very similar to the responsibles we just looked at, but there's a package that makes it very easy for you to basically um, separate um, your data. And your, if you've ever made like a partials directory for your views, um, this is very similar to making a partials directory, but structuring it so those partials in your data are kind of working together in tandem. If you're interested in it, literally just go Google Laravel View Components, and there's a great blog post exposing the whole thing for you. Um, but it's just one more way to think about it. And the, the benefit of that one is it actually has a, a method in your, um, in your Blade Components that makes it clear that you're working with one that's this way. OK. Uh, the payoff for using view data composition uh, patterns is that our controllers are slimmer. It's easier to test again. It's a clear grouping of the various responsibilities of our controller. Um, and finally, you get to use fun words like responsible and HTML-able. HTML 
HTML, blah, 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 blah. <laughs> My body thinks it's like 1 o'clock, 2 o'clock in the morning still, so give me a break. All right, so the primary thing I want you to walk away with is not everybody needs a root canal. So y'all didn't lock. Do you call it something different? Do you know what a root canal is? Yeah. Okay. I thought that was going to get a laugh because I told you all I got a root canal and you laugh at other people's pain, but that one didn't get anything, so <laughs> now you laughed. Okay, there we go. Uh, not everybody needs a root canal. Like, that's the primary concept here, right? Like, there are patterns that are problems. We regularly see this problem happen. There are patterns that are solutions. We regularly use this template to apply these, apply these problems when it's appropriate. And not everybody needs every single pattern solution. Not everybody needs a root canal because not everybody has a cracked tooth. Not everybody needs a microservice because not everybody has whatever the heck need you have for a microservice. And so, <laughs> Give your spouse, no, there's plenty of reasons. I'm just, uh, okay. I have written right microservices and not regretted them in my day. They're perfectly useful at plenty of times. Um, but most microservices in the world don't need to be microservices, honestly, because, because we use, and most repositories in the Laravel world don't need to be repositories. And a couple years before that, most command buses don't need to be command buses. And most DDD, oh, I'm not even going to go there. Um, <laughs> it's just like we get excited about something and we assume that that's what good programmers do. And it's not often bad. Like, for example, Sean McCool is friggin' brilliant. If you don't know Sean McCool, he's the head of Laracon EU. He's a really great guy. He's a really great thinker. He's super academic and he gets excited about things and shares them because he's brilliant and he thinks great and deep things. The problem is a lot of the rest of us who aren't super brilliant go, oh, Sean said I should do it. I'm going to do it everywhere. And Sean, the person who said the thing would be like, no, why would you do that? That's a terrible idea. <laughs> and so, but we're so excited about it that we're just like, I'm going to use it everywhere. So no matter what new and cool thing that you learn, remember that that's a tool that should be used in a specific circumstance. That's a solution that you should be used for a specific problem. And the problem is I can't tell you exactly which are global best practices and which should be used in each case, because it will differ a little bit depending on the makeup of your team, the type of code that you're writing, that kind of stuff. But in general, just remember that all of your patterns, some of them should be global, and some of them should be a response to a specific problem. Not everybody needs a root canal. So, oh, no, don't no, come back. Oh, that was really pretty and everything. The double clicker hit me at, right at the end. So I put all this stuff online. I put the slides online there. And I'll also link the videos there. There's going to be this video and the video from Laracon US. Um, you did such a good job of understanding my uh, fast talking. Probably should stop talking anyway, so this is good. <laughs> all right, well, thank you all very much. It was a pleasure.